Okay, hi everyone. Looks like we're about ready to go now. Uh, many thanks for joining us. We're pleased to have you with us today. My name is Jennifer Blundell. I'm the marketing manager here at Premier Corex and I will be your host today and I'm just going to talk you through some of the details about the session quickly and then we'll get started. So welcome. This is our third webinar now in our core analysis and EOR series. We have Jules Reed, our global technical manager back presenting for us today. And he'll be looking at the question, wettability, essential but meaningless. So Jules will run us through today some current wettability measurement methods, basic wettability controls and how it has changed and what can go wrong, and also look at the necessary measurement to ensure representative core data. So we do hope you can take as much value as you can from these sessions. Feel free to participate and interact with us. And of course, everyone is welcome to ask Jules as many questions as you might have throughout. So you should see the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, there is a chat function there as well, but we'd ask you use this Q&A function um, to pose any questions to Jill as he can easily see questions pop up on his screen from there. Um, he'll stop every so often to answer questions as they come in. Anything that might need a fuller answer or a little bit more discussion maybe, we might leave these to, until the end, but we will come back to them and we'll also factor in some time at the end for further questions as well. So we'll aim to last around 45 minutes to an hour today. So thank you everyone. I think that's all for me right now. Um, I'm happy to pass over to you to Jules now and he'll give us a brief intro and then he can get us started. Yes, good afternoon everyone or morning or depending on where you are in the world. I'm gonna be uh, looking at wettability as uh, as Jennifer uh, said, uh, just a very quick introduction. If you have not met me before, you don't know me, some of my background um, roundabout this time of year will be my 30th year in the industry. Um, I began in uh, around about June 1990. Um, I'm co-author of the book, which is shown on here, of Core Analysis, the Best Practice Guide. Um, uh, we, uh, we were a few years ago, uh, 2015, with a couple of co-authors, Colin McPhee and Itzaskin Zubizarreta. Um, I'm a former president of the Society of Core Analysts, I'm currently still on the director of ship of the, of the Society, and as a technical uh, committee member, I'm peer reviewing uh, the papers that come through there, and pe I'm peer reviewer for um, Spear and JPSE as well. I'm going to look at uh, if you uh, are not quite aware of uh, of Premier Oilfield Group or Premier Corex uh, Group was formed in 2016. Um, quite a number of different uh, chemistry and uh, geochemistry labs for the unconventional market in the, in the US. Um, it then acquired Forex uh, in 2016, which was gave it global presence. Um, uh, and Corex has been largely involved for many years, 40 years in core analysis and, um, and formation damage. Uh, we then acquired the ConocoPhillips Surface Lab and some of the personnel uh, came uh, uh, to work with Premier at the time as well uh, from Bartlesville in the States um, and uh, uh, later the Midland Sample Library which now the premier sample library. Um, so we have a wide range of different analyses, uh, different um, services that we can uh, supply. Um, uh, but today we're going to be looking particularly at wettability. And um, I coined this phrase um, a few years back, wettability essential but meaningless. And, and I use it partly uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, a little bit in jest, um, and, and partly mainly to be a little bit controversial and get us to think about wettability in a little more uh, than maybe we um, mostly do. Because often many people think of it water wet and oil wet, maybe mixed wet. But largely thinking about these. Um, big terms, one from one end of a spectrum to another end. Um, I also always put on this proviso by current measurement methods, 
Um, and, and that's about the, the meaningless. It's not really meaningless. Um, but uh, there are some uncertainties in, in the data. And as we go through, we'll look at those um, uncertainties. So what we'll do today is we'll look at the definition and terminology of some of the things that you will find in, in wettability. We'll look at some of the effects and some cautions on wetting measurements or just poor measurements in, in general, potentially. Um, we will then look at the, um, the different wetting states that you might make measurements in. Um, and then we'll look at some of the more common measurements that are made uh, in different laboratories the, uh, today. And, and then we'll go on and look at different wettability controls and alteration of wettability uh, and the using how to use those wettability data. What, what can we gain uh, from that information? So wettability is uh, described as the tendency of one fluid to spread on or adhere to a solid surface in the presence of another immiscible fluid. And, and so from the pictures here, you've got on, on the left-hand side, we've got a droplet of water, um, which is pulled down onto a surface, spreads onto the surface, and so you get this low contact angle. And the contact angle would be uh, the angle between the surface of the droplet with the other fluid um, and the surface of the droplet with the solid surface itself. And so the angle in here is the contact angle. That's in this particular case low and a low angle we will say the fluid is wetting and on the right we have a non-wetting fluid where the angle inside to the, uh, to the surface inside that bubble um, or droplet uh, the angle is high it's above 100 degrees and that we would call, generally call non-wetting. Um, we can think of this on just general day-to-day -day terms. You can uh, do this test at your house. Um, you can get a Teflon pan. You can place a droplet of water on your Teflon pan and it will look like uh, something on, on the right here because water is non-wetting. Teflon, um, most Teflons, not all of them, not all pans and not all non-stick pans, but most of them, they will be non-wetting to water and wetting to oil. And so on the left, you have this uh, pan surface wetting oil and you can see that the the edges of the oil they don't they're not holding a, sh a curved shape like this they're being pulled down onto the surface because oil is preferring to stick to the surface uh, more than it's preferring to stick to itself and so it spreads out onto the surface so we have these terminologies, water wet, oil wet. And what, what we mean by water wet is that the, the small spaces and all the surfaces of our core material, um, the grains and the minerals are coated with water. Um, oil may be present, but it will be in the middle of the pore spaces or in the large pore spaces. By oil wet, we mean exactly the opposite of that. So oil is filling the small spaces and oil is coating every grain and every mineral in that, that core. And then you have things like fractional wettability. We have mixed wettability. And, and fractional wet wettability is over here, I may have uh, some water wetness and over here I've got oil wetness. So you have these pockets of different wettability in different areas of the field or different areas of your core. And, and mixed wettability is where you have, just as it sounds, it's, it's generally mixed. Um, and that's probably the most common way we think about it. Large pores being filled with oil, small pores being uh, water wet, um, and the large pores potentially being oil wet. But there are other alternatives. I'm not going to discuss them today because it's a large um, discussion area and we're quite limited in time. Um, but then we have intermediate and neutral wettability. And the main difference between those is that in intermediate wetting, you could have a slight preference for oil and for water at the same time. They may have some 
um, similar, one may be slightly more prefer preferable than the other, um, but they will be quite similar. Whereas neutral wettability, as it sounds, is neutral. There is no preference for water, there's no preference for oil. Um, and just to show you that it's much more complex than we normally consider it, um, this is a picture of a pore space with a grain of quartz here on, on the right with water wetting the quartz. You can see that it's being pulled down onto the surface at the edges of that quartz. It's a droplet of water on these intermixed the clays here. Uh, that droplet of water is not wetting, it's sitting as, as a droplet by itself. And so even within a pore space, you have changing or different wettability depending upon the surface that, it's, um, that the fluid is touching. So what are the impacts of, of wettability? Why is it essential that we have correct wettability when we make measurements? Well, let's take, for instance, relative permeability. Relative permeability, correct wetting is essential. Here you have a, a, a range of different relative permeability curves based on different wetting types. Um, for um, an oil wet system, the oil curve tends to be much more curved, whilst the water curve is flatter. Um, and it's the opposite in a water wet system. So the water uh, curve is, is more curved and the oil curve is, is um, so it's important that we get the correct wettability, otherwise we may measure relative permeability incorrectly. Capillary pressure is very dependent on wettability. So my primary drainage here in black, is my uh, drainage capillary pressure in a water wet state, because generally we consider our reservoirs to have begun as a water filled environment and water wet then you have a migration of the oil into the system and then some time and uh, temperature and pressure and uh, wetting will, may change you may you may still have a fairly water wet curve um, for imbibition and that would be this blue curve here um, but if you had a more oil wet curve you'd have some capillary pressure that looks more like this red curve here so it's important for capillary pressure. Correct wetting is essential. And for spontaneous processes, um, if a core is water wet, it will draw in or suck in water, imbibe water very, very rapidly and then stabilize. If it were uh, oil wet and placed into water, you'd basically get no real spontaneous imbibition. Um, you were to place an oil wet core into oil, um, then it will pull oil into the curve uh, in a similar manner to this water wet curve pulling water in. And residual oil saturation is also controlled uh, somewhat by uh, wettability. Uh, this is a classic graph from several different papers, um, uh, Jahun, Jahunden and Morrow. Uh, Watson and Chen. Um, and what we see here is that from a, a water wet case up at this end where uh, the water, the wetting indices is one through to zero where my wetting index is close to neutral or mixed um, down to negative one where it's oil wet. Um, we have this changing residual oil saturation. Um, now I think that much of the data here is a function of how the test has been performed because realistically and theoretically what we would expect over time uh, over changing uh, wettability is for an oil wet case we should be coming further more down into lower saturations or ultimate saturations but we'll discuss um, ultimate residual saturation a little bit later. So wetting is essential, but some cautions when, when we're making measurements, and I, I discussed this um, a, a few weeks back in a previous webinar, that um, when we're making measurements, we've got to ensure that the samples that we're using are representative of our reservoir. 
So there should be non-damaged material. Uh, we don't want to damage the clays because that will alter the saturation and capillary pressure relationship that, that will be observed. We don't really want the samples to be open to the atmosphere because that will cause oxidation. And oxidation, we'll see later, um, that may change wettability. Um, and there could be precipitation, which can change the wettability of the core as well. So we want to uh, make sure we've got samples that are um, under as preserved as possible and under the representative wetting conditions of our reservoir. And we need to start from the correct starting point in terms of um, saturation. Our reservoir is currently at some um, water saturation and uh, either gas or oil saturation. When we start our wettability analysis, we need to start from that same saturation point of the reservoir because that denotes the current wetting conditions. So we want representative material. We want representative conditions. Um, and and um, there are questions about what is representative. Um, so whether you use dead crude oil for aging or you use live crude oil for aging, um, one of the um, cutoff points there is, is in, usually in terms of GOR. If GOR is greater than 200 sus per barrel or 40 cubic meters per cubic meter, um, then generally you, you consider that the dead oil might be very different to my live oil. And so you might need to look at using live oil systems. So we have to consider what state and what, what uh, condition is going to represent uh, my reservoir most. And there are three different types of wetting state that we can make measurements in. Um, we've got fresh state, which sometimes is called native state or as received state. And this sounds as though this would be the best and easiest way to make measurements because we just take ore from our reservoir, it comes to the lab and we start to use it. But what, um, what we will find uh, and what we explained or what I explained in a previous webinar uh, regarding coring is that there are various changes that can happen um, that may interfere with wetting during the coring process. And, and so we have to make some assessments if we're going to do fresh state. Um, it's not as easy as it first sounds. We have to make sure that there's been no saturation change. So the saturation is still the same. If we've had water imbibition or by, be, because of um, mud invasion, then um, that's, we've already started along part of the imbibition process, which is used in the wetting analysis. And we have to make sure there's no other changes. So oil-based mud the, uh, often contains surfactants and can change the wettability. Um, so we need to ensure that there's been no, no surfactants or no invasion of those fluids. Um, asphalt, we want to try and ensure there's been no asphalt precipitation or salt precipitation, because that can change my wettability as well. And then um, we probably want to look at exchanging the fluids that we already have in place with some controlled fluid, um, and, but without changing actual saturation history. So that's a difficult process. Um, but, so why, why would we measure fresh state wettability? Well, one of the reasons would be because some um, may state that, well, that's um, representative of the current wettability of my reservoir um, but we need to be careful with how we deal with those samples or we would use it to determine what the current wettability state is of the samples received um, and that current uh, um, that just check that there's been no change um, or we want to make a comparison against our restored state samples to see how our um, the majority of our tests compare to the, the fresh state system. Um, someone's asked a question, does wettability depend on um, either surface or interfacial tension? Um, and the answer basically is yes. Um, I haven't shown it in here, but basically what you will have is you have 
tension between the surface and, and a droplet, tension between um, this flu droplet fluid um, and the other fluid, and tension between that other fluid and the surface. And, and there's a balance uh, within there. It's all about surface tension, which is about surface chemistry. Um, so this is a chemical process. Um, so the other state that we have is, is clean state wettability. And I mean, in clean state wettability, what we start to do is, is remove the, the pore fluids, the, uh, the reservoir fluids, and replace them with completely controlled fluids. We will clean the sample with solvents. Um, it will generally change the wettability um, towards water wet. And that's, uh, that's performed on purpose. And because, as said earlier, we, we believe that our reservoir began as a water-filled environment, and um, we want to start at that same water-filled environment and water wet because no oil has been present yet. Um, so we will perform cleaning and saturate and establish an SWI. Establish the same saturation as the reservoir, and then perform our wettability. Wettability starts as primary imbibition. So why would we perform a clean state measurement? Well, we want to look at um, maybe a water wet imbibition capillary pressure. And um, that might be for say a paleo contact or in a, in a gas system or some other um, a change in uh, saturation in my reservoir um, historically. Um, also, it, I, I, we, I would suggest you need to do it to check that the cleaning has worked properly, that the cleaning has given you water wet core. Um, and if, it, if you don't have water wet core after cleaning, then there are a number of different questions you need to start um, asking. We don't really have time to go into today. Um, probably the most common um, test performed on most samples, either for wettability or for capillary pressure, if it's uh, in, say inhibition capillary pressure or for relative permeability, is restored state. Um, and I we would suggest doing restored state wettability to verify um, that the restoration process seems to have gone well, that we've altered wettability back to something uh, close to um, the reservoir. Um, and uh, you would be using then um, dead oil or a live oil to establish the change in wetting. Um, there are a number of questions here. I'm going to I'm going to come back to the questions um, later um, at the towards the end. Um, so let's look at measurements. Uh, there, um, I'm only going to look at three types of measurement. I'm going to look at contact angle, combined AMOC USBN, and um, some, some more modern digital rock measurements. So this is the um, contact angle. Um, it's done by what's called the Cessar drop technique. We have a gomiometer, um, with, which it consists of um, some a needle for applying droplets and a camera high power uh, high resolution camera so that we can get a very good close images um, of droplets and we can measure the angle from of the surface uh, to a tangent to the um, contact with the the, uh, the bubble um, and and this just shows you um, that uh, those two droplets at the start. Um, and that's a function of time as well. So we have to leave time for it to stabilize and, and um, uh, reach some form of equilibrium because contact angle is, is really a static property. Um, but we will usually, or it's usually wise to also measure the dynamic properties because the dynamic properties change. And that's what I was showing in this previous slide little. As you move the droplet, if you and put it between two plates and move it, um, you will see a slight change in the angle depending on whether the droplet is advancing, whether it's moving forward, or whether it's receding. 
and, and I'm just going to show you uh, some uh, videos of this process. So that's a, a water wet case, the droplet um, as it spreads out onto the surface and you can see there's the surface and there's the angle through the surface, it's a low angle um, and so we would say that is strongly wetting. Um, then we have this one, is uh, some mixed wetting or intermediate wetting and these, these are being performed, uh, this is from Massachusetts um, Institute of Technology, MIT in the States performed on acrylic surfaces where you can control the wettability towards water. Um, and you can see with this one, we've got an angle here of maybe about 60 degrees. Um, so it's less wetting than the previous one. Um, and it's somewhere be in between. Um, and then here's one non-wetting. And, and again, there's the, the surface. There's the tangent and an angle to the surface, and you can see that's a, a high angle, probably over 100 degrees, um, and so non-wetting. And um, my favorite one, um, ultra non-wetting. And we see there the droplet doesn't even contact the surface. Well, it contacts it, but it doesn't, it doesn't stick to the surface. It has no spread. It prefers to stay with itself. And so we see this water droplet bouncing off the surface. So that's the contact angle measurement, um, the AMOT um, USBM. So this is probably the most common um, process performed by most core laboratories. Um, is, um, you can perform a pure AMOT process or a USBM, but very often it, it's, it's wise to do a, a combined AMOP and USBM together in the same test. Um, so it starts off with spontaneous in an AMOP cell like this, which is a glass cell. As this is from AMOP's paper in 1958. Um, and this is uh, just some car a cartoon of the process here um, on the right. So we place the oil-filled sample at SWI into the water. Um, the water, if it's water wet, it will imbibe water. That water is being drawn in and it must be, it must replace um, oil coming out. And so we measure the oil as it comes out. We can measure a volume of oil in the spontaneous process. We can then put it through a forced process, um, which I'm going to explain for USBM in, in a minute. And we put it through a forced process, obtain another volume. And the ratio of this spontaneous volume compared to the total volume over the imbibition process is our water wet index. We then place it into an inverted cell uh, under oil and, uh, and wait to see is do we get any spontaneous oil imbibition and if we see that we get a spontaneous oil volume, divide that by a forced oil volume or the, or the total spontaneous plus the forced and we get our oil wet index. And this can also be done um, in a pore holder. Uh, so you could do this at overburden if necessary. Um, and you can place uh, the sample in, um, into a slightly modified process into a separator, um, flow just along the surfaces rather than through the sample. So the arrows here are just showing you counter current uh, flow um, and, uh, and then monitor the change of volume. Uh, in a spontaneous process. When you've done the spontaneous and the forced, what you're then left with is, is you take the oil wet index from the water wet index uh, to get your Amot Harvey wettability index. And if it's less than negative three, you would generally call it water wet. Um, if it's between negative 0.3 and positive 0.3, um, it's called neutral or mixed wet. And above positive 0.3, it would call it water wet. Um, those are old terminologies and, and a bit too broad. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's quite it's more complex than that. And it's a scale uh, from water wet to oil wet. For this combined USBM process, the forced portion we've placed into a centrifuge and we perform a, a USBM or United States Board of Mines process and that's basically placing it into a centrifuge 
monitoring production as a, 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 at a particular um, speed, which applies a force to the system. We monitor production from through that uh, from that force. Um, once that is stabilized, we apply a higher force and we get more production. And we keep doing that process at higher and higher speeds, higher and higher forces or capillary pressure. Um, and we monitor and we measure the volume out. We can then plot that um, as a, a plot of saturation versus pressure, which is a capillary pressure curve. And we can calculate the area under the curve. Um, we calculate the area under the curve in, in, in the vision. So that would be this portion here in the bottom. And we would calculate it in then secondary drainage. And we take the ratio of the, uh, of the two areas, the log of the ratio of the upper area divided by the lower area is our USBM index. What the area is telling us is the amount of force required to displace that fluid. So um, the, in this particular case, the force required to remove uh, water, which is this here, um, is quite small compared to the force required to remove oil. So the, the sample is trying to hold on to oil. It requires much more force to remove the oil. And so this would be oil wet. In this case here on the right, it's roughly equal. So that would be mixed wet or intermediate or neutral. And uh, in the USBM, you also have a negative. Um, if it's negative, it's oil wet. A, a zero would be neutral or mixed wet. And if it's positive, you generally class it as water wetting. So you get these two different indices from the same measurement. And then to look at the digital rock um, measurement. So um, a number of uh, uh, research in institutes have uh, been, uh, and uh, some uh, commercial places, we can take a sample, we can do uh, micro CT images, um, we can have it with the fluids in place and we can measure the angle of, uh, this is an oil droplet here, and we can measure the angle that the oil droplet is touching a surface. And we can measure the different angles that we see in different droplets throughout the oil. And what we've, if we do that and count up the number of angles that we've uh, measured within the same sample, uh, what we will observe is a distribution of different angles. Um, and this is, so there's the distribution. Here's my actual cumulative frequency, a probability of, of uh, curve of that distribution. And what we see is then, we have a, a, an average of about 45 degrees, but with plus or minus 10 degrees of variance around that. Um, so our capillary, our contact angle and actually the wettability index that we measure is an average of all the different wettabilities inside the pore spaces of that sample. That's why I was saying it's, it's much more complex than we, um, generally uh, put it in terms of these water wet, oil wet terms. So what controls wettability? Um, well, initially water. So the presence of water inhibits oil from um, accessing the surface. Uh, the salinity and composition of that water also has an impact because this is a chemical process. And what has been found in a number of studies, uh, particularly in the low salinity injection processes, is that multivalent ions, so the two plus or three positive ions, uh, like calcium, magnesium, or um, iron, um, appear to be very important in uh, the wetting or wetting change process. And, there, and then the pH is, is important. Um, the rock competition, Composition is important. So, um, as a classic case, carbonates are basic. The calcium ion at the surface of the carbonates creates a slight positive charge. Um, so, that is wetted by an acidic oil because acids have a slight negative charge. So, positive attract negative, um, and, so you, and so they will wet the surface. 
And um, we just need to think about, say, the Middle East. The carbonates in the Middle East um, are basic, and in the Middle East you have very acidic oils. Um, and so those carbonates have a much greater affinity uh, to that, that uh, Middle East oil. If you come to the North Sea, um, the carbonates in the North Sea, like some of the North Sea chalks, the North Sea oils tend to be a bit more basic. And so the basic carbonate with a basic um, oil has less affinity. And so they tend to be less oil wet. They tend to be slightly more onto the water wet scale. Um, silicates tend to be acidic, and so they would be more wetted by basic oils. Um, and different minerals have different um, basic or acidic properties, and some of them can alter the wettability. And kaolinite is one of those. Kaolinite is known to, to switch wettability depending on the pH of the system. And the, of course, the oil properties and the oil components. And these are, are the main. Uh, just showing some of the main components of the oil that are relevant to wetting gains, for, um, creating oil wet conditions. So we've got these nitrogen, sulfur and oxygen uh, bearing hydrocarbons. Um, so if you have a very light um, saturate system, like a gas system, you don't observe any wetting change because it, it's just gas parts, it's just um, um, saturate components, there are no resins. As you get heavier and heavy oils with um, more complexity and different non-hydrocarbon components and these polar components, then you have the more, the more potential of having a non-water wet system. So um, those are the main controls chemically on it, but um, how is it altered? Well, um, temperature is one of the things where we can see change, um, either in terms of uh, creating wettability in the lab and restoring wettability. It normally doesn't happen until we apply temperature, or by um, taking a sample out of its current reservoir and the temperature change. Because what might happen um, is that you could have precipitation because of um, a reduced solubility of salts or of of asphaltines and resins um, and, and so you may change the wettability from this precipitation of those components. Um, but because this is a chemical process you need energy in that chemical process. So we need the temperature provides the energy of the system. Um, so we have to do this at reservoir temperature and sometimes you might have to consider as my reservoir been at a historically different temperature to its current day temperature. And pressure reduction, obviously um, as we reduce pressure we get evolution of gas, that changes the composition of oil. If I change the composition of my oil it might lead to a change in wettability. Um, and then oxidation. Oxidation, oxidating oil components can create carboxylic acids like this one here. And that can then, that is a natural surfactant. So all of those nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen components of my oil, they are the natural surfactants of my system. And we know from um, our mud systems, mud to filtrate and mud chemistry, that surfactants can alter the wettability. And it's those portions, those natural surfactants of my crude oil or live oil that change the wettability. And time, you need time to change the wettability. Um, if it's wrong, uh, let's say carbonate, strong basic uh, um, reservoir with a strongly acidic oil, then that can happen quite quickly because it's a strong and rapid process. But if it's, it's quite a weak um, series of um, polar components, then it may take much longer time. Um, and this is just showing you, this was just to show the difference by, that, that drilling mud can make. So these two samples here, um, they are two samples where there's been a mud filtrate invasion. Um, after cleaning, uh, they're showing this spontaneous imbibition profile, which if you remember the, the, the graph from earlier, this is more like an oil wet. Like, uh, this is water wet. And 
um, a different well from that same field was cut with a different mud system. And when after cleaning, they were all showing water wet conditions. Um, so the mud chemistry can have an impact. It's not always, some, uh, most often it probably can be cleaned out of the system, but sometimes it's difficult to clean these, thing, these mud components out. And so one recommendation is always to do a wettability check on clean samples to make sure that you've not had significant change in the mud system. So how do we use these data? What, what can we actually use the wettability data for? Um, well, um, one of the things is part of the test, if we do that, that combined AMOT USBM, part of that test, we get a capillary pressure and we get the imbibition capillary pressure. And that can be used for understanding things like paleo contacts, um, so if we've had a change in con oil water contact, and so um, we've now got some um, oil below the current oil water contact, um, we can under maybe understand that from an imbibition capillary. Um, or if we're doing imbibition monitoring, um, where in a water flood, the, the imbibition capillary pressure is where our reservoir is heading to in terms of saturation. Um, or determining um, SW in swept zones. Um, it could be used. And uh, one of the, the major uses in terms of laboratory is to do um, correction of relative permeability because our relative permeability in the lab is impacted by capillary pressure and understanding the imbibition capillary pressure um, is the, one of the only ways of determining our true rel perm. And from that centrifuge imbibition, centrifuge imbibition is probably is one of the few ways that where we can obtain and achieve true or ultimate residual oil saturation. And then we can use also use it as a guide to what our relative permeability data might be. If we don't know what our rel perm is, here's some useful potential end um, point measurements, some um, endpoint permeabilities based on different wetting states, some initial uh, saturations and residual saturations based on wetting states, um, and, some, and the Cori curvature that you might expect from different wetting states. And of course, these are just guides. Um, these are, will largely going to be actually determined by your reservoir property, which is why um, the, it's important to understand wettability, but um, the, the wettability um, number itself is, is, is a guide to the, your reservoir property. So in, in summary, before we look at some questions, um, wettability is a fundamental control on our reservoir properties. Uh, and so we, we need to understand what the wettability is of our current reservoir. Um, we need to have representative laboratory wettability uh, when we measure rep to measure representative field data in the lab. Uh, and that, for that, correct water saturation is important to have representative wettability. Um, wettability will, is, um, will need to be used to cross-check our reservoir wettability, to look at um, cleaning efficiency uh, of our cleaning process to make sure we get back to water wet conditions and to, and to check um, what our current wet abilities uh, may be in the reservoir. And it will also give us some very useful information. It will give us imbibition capillary pressure if we do the combined AMOT USBM, uh, imbibition capillary pressure, um, and it will also give us this true residual oil saturation. So that was all I was going to speak to uh, today. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and so we will take uh, uh, some of these questions. And, uh, um, so if I've received many samples from a company, how can I uh, screen and select good samples to measure and run contact angle tests? Um, 
contact angles, I, I did mention them as, as one, they, they are uh, difficult to do because you have to have a flat surface. Um, and depending on the grain size, if you've got a very coarse grained, um, unconsolidated system, it's going to be extremely difficult to actually get a contact angle there. I mean, if you've got a very tight, very fine grained system, it might be uh, much easier. Um, but, um, but it seems like you should. You needed to um, join us on a, on a previous uh, webinar where we we discussed about, about the sample condition. So one of the things is 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 discussed with a, a core analysis laboratory. Um, good sample. What is a good sample? Um, I would I would recommend getting in contact either with us or, uh, well, of course, with us um, to to ask that question. And can I use one sample uh, for many measurements, or do I need to uh, to use a sa um, one sample for each condition, um, temperature and pressure? Um, it it depends on the process. Um, it depends on the actual measurement. Um, so certain uh, measurements, you could use the same sample from one test into the next test, um, but certain processes, you may need to use different samples. Um, so sorry, it's a, it's a bit of an open uh, answer, but um, that's the reality of those types of measurements. Um, what's the relationship between relative permeability, capillary pressure, and wettability? <laughs> um, I think that's... Um, I'm actually going to, one of the, one of the um, possible future webinars is relative permeability. And um, I'm going to be discussing that topic probably in much more detail uh, in that. We don't really have time to go into it because it's, it's quite complex. Um, so I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll suggest come back to our, our future uh, webinar. Um, how do you ensure you, your core SWI is representative of the reservoir? Um, that's a good question. Um, you, you need to um, look at the logs. Um, you need to understand the logs. You need to have good control between the logs and your core, uh, routine core data. Um, and you, uh, to, um, uh, and to check that the, um, the saturation for the height in the reservoir, so you need to know your free water level um, in the reservoir. So you can calculate height above free water level, and that will, from that, you can determine what capillary pressure is, and then from a capillary pressure curve to a saturation, um, check that your saturation is in the agreement um, with the saturations that you're seeing in your reservoir. Um, so that's the process that you'd be using there. And the wettability of a rock or a subsurface be changed? Um, yes, um, we, we do it all the time. Um, the, the wettability of the rock is changed when we um, put it through cleaning. It's taken from whatever, if it was an oil wet core, it will go through cleaning and it should come out water wet. Um, also, um, placing surfactant down hole with mud systems changes the wettability of, of where the, that surfactant um, however much it invades into the reservoir will change the wettability. And some EOR processes um, work on the process of changing wettability. Um, yeah, so um, good question. Um, next one is, um, do you acknowledge the wettability changes via well stimulation method by injecting special chemicals which have a few solvents in it? Um, if yes, is three foot penetration in a cased hole sufficient or is more required? Um, I think that's, uh, d without knowing the, all the other parameters of um, permeability, et cetera, um, it's, that's a difficult one to, to answer. Um, maybe we can um, discuss that outside of, uh, of here. Um, the next one is, um, could you please tell the reason um, of, for imbibition curve, not tracing the same path as the drainage hole. Um, part of it is changing wettability. Um, so in the drainage curve, um, so I think that will be going back to uh, my capillary pressure curve here, uh, where the primary drainage um, curve 
is different to then that the, even the water wet in the vision um, curve. And a part of that is that maybe you might have had a small change in wettability anyway, um, but part of it is just um, evaporation hysteresis, which is why when uh, at the start I was saying about fresh state, you need to ensure that you don't um, have any change in saturation uh, to start the wettability because um, that you may have some saturation hysteresis um, and that will change the curve and it will change the apparent wettability but doesn't actually change wettability. Um, could we consider saturation of the flushed zone um, estimation from basic logs to give an indication of wettability? Um, I, I, I would need to take a bit more thought um, than the time um, uh, allows here on, on that question. So I'll, I'll maybe answer that. I'll, most of these questions will put out a document with answers to, to the questions um, and I'll, I'll look at answering that in, in there. Um, how are we doing for time, Jennifer? Well, we've got a few minutes still. Yeah, we have seven or so minutes. So um, unless the coring program has been designed at the outset, with an important objective being to retain natural wettability, wettability tests must best be considered indicative as there are too many variables or unknowns. Um, in fact, most of the fresh state tests, uh, bar say steam start, will be subject to uncertainty. Um, yeah, that's what I said at the, at the very start. Um, in terms of fresh state um, data, there are a number of checks that you have to do. Um, you have to tick off. Um, and, uh, some of those are that you've not had invasion. That you've, not, uh, all, um, you, you've not had ashwalking precipitation. Um, so to, to not have invasion, uh, and to, that, that means that you've got to have started considering the impact before you call and and that was the the point of my webinar um first webinar we gave core analysis doesn't start in the lab it starts with coring and coring has to be done with the objectives in mind uh, to ensure that we get uh, good data um, thank you for that question um, how can we recognize the mixed wettability rock from relative permeability curves and from AMOP tests too? Um, so the uh, one of the, the so the relative permeability curves here. Um, obviously, your rel perm curve may not look as as nice and exact as this, but generally there are some general rules. I would be quite hesitant to say a direct wettability from a relative permeability curve is only indicative. Um, from an AMOT test, um, it, it will depend on that AMOT number. So if you remember from an, an AMOT test, you it goes from a value of one uh, to zero to negative one. Um, and negative one would be fully oil wet, positive one is fully water wet. Um, so if you're mixed wet, you're somewhere between. And, and quite often, say, as somewhere between zero, negative 0 0.5 and, neg and positive 0 0.5 is, is mixed wet, really. And most oil reservoirs, I would suggest, are mixed wet um, or some version of mixed wet. They may be slightly more to the water wet side of the scale or slightly more to the oil wet side of the scale, but they're some form of mixed. Um, we have a preserved core saved uh, in good conditions from years ago. Um, can I use for a wettability test? Um, that's, that's one of the things as well that we discussed in, in a previous webinar. Um, if a person wants to get in contact, we can provide the webinar slides. Um, and and um, basically, we, if you, the best way to preserve is, is either one preservation or under in a sealed container of fluid and the only way to ensure it's got good conditions is to check the core um, it, one one is a weight check if it has the same weight as it did before 
if, if the condition of preservation is still maintained, so if it's in wax and the, and the wax seal is still intact, um, then it's usually it's a good, it will be useful and, and usable and in good condition. Um, and probably following on from that, in the same sense, um, how do the signature of, oh no, it's following on from the rel perm one, how does the signature of relative permeability and residual oil and initial saturate, water saturation um, uh, for mixed wet? Are there any kind of rules? I, I think this last slide actually answers your question there. Um, core cleaning and aging has um, a large effect on wettability and residual oil saturations. What are the recommended solvents and cores uh, cleaning and aging methods? <laughs> um, that's a big answer. Um, I, again, the, there are standard um, uh, solvents that could be used. Um, the, so the most common toluene and methanol, they are generally quite good. Um, but there are a range of different solvents um, and, and uh, different methods. And the methods of cleaning may depend on your ultimate objective of as well. Um, uh, so I, I'm, that's a difficult one. Uh, simple, uh, it seems a simple uh, question. It's a difficult and long answer. Um, there's a lot of dependencies in that answer. Um, We've just got four questions left. Um, so if, if everyone's still interested and, and wanting to hang on, we'll finish uh, what we can of those. Um, why is strongly water wet uh, showing less residual oil than a, a neutral wet um, displayed in my, uh, slide seven? And probably about the rel perm. Um, go back. Oh, that's not. Seven. Um, I, th I think that's oh, I think that's probably um, about my rel perm curve here, um, and th because here's my oil wet, which is showing zero point zero five as a residual oil, and water wet, which is twenty five percent point two five residual oil, and this is one of the um, uh, um, the things about wettability. So wettability is a strong control. In the water wet case, what you'll see as well, if we're starting from higher saturation, we're going to higher residual, um, but what you, will happen is you have a much better sweep efficiency and you, you have breakthrough. So the crossover point is almost breakthrough. It's not quite breakthrough, but it, you, we can say breakthrough is approximately here. So you have late breakthrough um, with a very little uh, a small additional production of uh, tail production at the end and uh, usually in very strong cases no additional tail um, in a single um, in a single layer um, so what you what happens is you get to that residual very quickly um, and fairly efficient whilst in an oil wet case what you can see here is we, we get a much lower uh, breakthrough point with a much longer um, a, so a tail. So you'll start producing water and oil um, and you'll have to start separating. And so it becomes uneconomical and actually will take longer to achieve this. So you're in your reservoir, you'll actually never achieve this. Um, but for another um, webinar, we're gonna look at residual oil saturation and why is it necessary to know this point here um, when I'm never going to get it in my reservoir and it is important. Um, what's the difference in saturation uh, from capillary pressure and uh, from Archie in the in produced reservoirs? Um, if, if everything is tying in well together it shouldn't be any difference. Um, Capillary pressure is basically just describing your reservoir as a function of height. Um, and different rock types will have a different saturation as a function of height. Archie is, is uh, describing it as a function of the electric log. 
And so it's an electrical measurement uh, within the same layer. Um, what's your view on using dead oil in a primary drainage uh, capillary pressure test? Um, the theory of uh, water wet, starting from a water wet condition can be invalidated as the dead crude can change a water wet plug towards oil wet in a matter of hours. Um, I think that's a, a long discussion and there's debate in the, uh, in the industry about which is um, most viable. So if you inject um, a, a, a laboratory oil, which has no um, natural surfactants, no polar components, um, you inject the, pole, the, the laboratory oil, it will not change wettability. Um, so by the time you end, you, you start the test, you end the test in water wet conditions. Your reservoir, um, as oil migrated in, in that primary process, and then the preceding, or the succeeding years, should I say, um, the oil in place has begun to change wettability. And, and as, as it changes wettability, it pushes the water down the reservoir. And so your capillary pressure may um, be slightly different as a wetting chain to the, um, the capillary pressure um, the, of a water wet condition. So the, um, both are viable. I would, I, would, I would test, by the end of a dead age test or dead crude test, um, your sample should be um, aged. Um, and, and wettability restored to the current wettability of the reservoir. And that's an overly simplistic answer uh, for a complex question. Um, we'll t have this as the, uh, the two, two more. Do other minerals in the core contribute to mixed wet conditions of sandstone rather than quartz changing wettability due to aging over time? Yes. Um, smectite. Smectite is, is known uh, to, to be potentially oil wetting. Kaolinite um, as well uh, um, can be oil or water wetting depending on pH. Um, Camosite um, is an iron, ver iron rich version of chlorite and it tends to be oil wet, naturally oil wet, whilst camothite itself, the non iron, sorry, chlorite itself, non iron version or non-ferric version of camphorite tends to be uh, water well. So yes, the minerals play an important role. Um, and the last question that we'll take just now, what, uh, do you think that the wetting, wettability can change the fundamental mechanical properties of a given material, i.e. strength and Young's modulus? I've got to say, I don't know. Um, I've never actually looked into the properties um, what I do know is that um, if you clean a chalk sample and, and so measure a chalk sample dry, um, you get a different strength. Um, or, well, it's not just a chalk sample, it will be other, um, probably sandstones will be slightly, be not as impacted as chalk. But um, um, so chalk is, is strongest with, it's unusual, chalk is unusual, it's strongest with um, gas present, um, then its next um, greatest strength is when, it's, when oil is present, when you bring water present, it becomes softer um, and so has less strength. So the fluids, on a, at least on chalk, can have an impact on, um, on rock mechanics. Um, I presume they ca could then have impact on other um, rock types as well, um, but I've I've not actually not seen those data. Um, but a very very interesting uh, question. So thank you for that. Um, sorry for the uh, the questions that have come in after where I said uh, we'd cut off. Um, I will answer those uh, by email. Um, thank you very much for your patience and and time uh, today. Great, thank you Jules. Thank you everyone. I know we went over a bit on time there, but thank you for all your interactions and questions. Um, we will definitely get back to any of those that we didn't answer by email and follow up with you. We'll also be sending out a link tomorrow to the webinar recording for you so you can revisit the slides then.
and you can also see our webinar and some more of our technical feature videos coming soon on our Premier Oilfield Group and Premier Codex YouTube channels. There's actually a lot of great content up there already and we're adding to this almost weekly at the moment so if you're interested please do just take a look. Um, you can also subscribe which means you'll get updated on more of our content hot off the press so to speak as they are released in the coming weeks. Look out for Jules, his next webinar is scheduled for the 9th of July, which will be a really interesting one as he takes a look at and talks us through some of the general learnings from his 30 years experience of carrying out core analysis experiments and reviewing data results. I'm just going to try and push you through a little poll here as well, because um, it would be great to see from you if you have any specific topics that you would like to see from us on our future webinars on core analysis and EOR. So you should see that up on the screen now if you'd like to take a look. Um, we'll also be back again in a couple of weeks time with the next webinar in our formation damage series on the 25th of June. And Justin Green will be back and he'll be taking a look at improved sanding assessment and sand control and be giving us some expert insight into some of the key questions surrounding that topic. So. Keep checking our social pages for more info and the registration details will be up shortly. And yeah, we're always willing to host focus webinars, Q&As and technical sessions and trainings for you as always, for you and your teams. You might know someone that's missed the webinar today um, and we'd be very happy to rerun this for you um, and maybe do a bit more focused on specific requirements and issues that you and your teams may have. So yeah, please feel free to get in touch. We'll look to bring you the webinar topics that is the the most um, votes. I can't really tell at the moment because it's very even, but <laughs> um, we'll get those really shortly. Um, so thanks from all for us today, and we look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks' time if you're able to join us. Sorry we went a bit over, but thank you everyone.